In the year 2006, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest, reigned supreme at the box office, while the Boston crime saga, The Departed, led to the first and only Oscar for director Martin Scorsese. But in the 15 years since then, one other film has also become a cultural milestone due to its weirdly prescient views of the future. A film so neglected in its initial release that the studio didn't even bother to make a trailer for it. Dubbed the smartest stupid movie ever made, Idiocracy was barely a box office blip when it was quietly released in September 2006. Why was this film from renowned creator Mike Judge tossed aside and left to die by the studio? Mutilate your thirst as we find out what the fuck happened to this movie. Mike Judge is no prophet, just an average guy. Born in Ecuador and raised in New Mexico, Judge would later graduate from University of California, San Diego with a degree in physics. But after working several menial jobs in his chosen field, he found himself getting bored. So he did what every person does when they don't like physics anymore, become a bass player for the Shamu Band at SeaWorld in San Diego, and follow that by touring with blues musicians Anson Funderburg and Doyle Bramhall. At this point, Judge had also started messing around with animation, even purchasing a 16mm camera to make his own animated shorts. This led to the creation of Frog Baseball, based on a conversation he once overheard where two people actually discussed such a thing. Judge thought to himself, who the hell would do that? How about Beavis and Butthead? This short, which aired as part of the MTV series Liquid Television, was so popular that it led to MTV signing Judge to create the now iconic series Beavis and Butthead. The show aired nearly 200 episodes in the span of just five years, with many critics accusing the show of being responsible for the dumbing down of America. You're a stupid dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> that controversy didn't matter, as Beavis and Butthead has become one of television's longest lasting properties, with a successful theatrical film in 1996, a new season in 2011, and more soon to come. Judge would make the leap to live action with Office Space, based on his animated Milton shorts another case of the creator taking inspiration from real life. The character was based on an actual man he had worked with in his engineering days. Judge noticed that no one would ever talk to the man, so one day he stopped and said hi, and that simple gesture gave the man the audience he had been waiting for to unload all of his frustrations, including a threat to burn the building down if they moved his desk again. Even though we now think of Office Space as a modern classic, it was actually a blink and you'll miss it affair. Even before its release, the studio showed very little faith in the film, telling Judge he needed to amp up the energy and get rid of the gangster rap. Leading up to its release in February 1999, the marketing left a lot to be desired, with Judge and several cast members absolutely hating the theatrical poster of a man covered in post-it notes, making it look more like an ad for Big Bird or Office Depot, not a comedy film. Office Space would only make $10 million in theaters. One studio head reportedly told Judge, nobody wants to see your little movie about ordinary people and their boring little lives. Even though Office Space crashed and burned theatrically, it quickly gained a following on home video, particularly with viewers who could sympathize with its eerily accurate depiction of 9 to 5 cubicle life. Because of that eventual success, 20th Century Fox was anticipating Judge's next project. It took a few years, but eventually Judge pitched his idea for idiocracy, the concept of a society that gradually gets dumber is actually not a new one, previously explored in stories like Cyril M. Kornbluth's 1951 short, The Marching Morons. But Judge credited his inspiration for the idea to a trip he once had taken to Disneyland. While he and his daughter stood in line waiting for a ride, two nearby women, each with children in strollers, began arguing loudly and screaming profanities. This prompted Judge to think, is this the future Walt Disney had envisioned for his theme park? He also thought about the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, contemplating a different futuristic setting where instead of the monolith and everything being pristine and advanced, what if it was the Jerry Springer show and giant Walmarts? When Judge sat down to write the script, which was then titled The United States of America, he used his own school experience as a guideline. When a teacher would be disappointed in the class's test scores and point out that Judge was the only student who did well, the other school kids would be furious and say, we are going to beat the shit out of you after class. So when writing the movie, he essentially imagined his junior high class taking over the world. Once the production got rolling, the film's cast came together quickly, with Luke Wilson as ordinary guy Joe Bowers, later known as Not Sure, a remarkably unremarkable army librarian, selected for a suspended animation experiment that goes wrong. He's joined by SNL regular Maya Rudolph as prostitute and future first lady Rita, Dax Shepard as avid TV watcher and lawyer Frito Pendejo, 
and Terry Crews as President Dwayne Elizondo Mountain Dew Herbert Camacho, a role he auditioned for several times, even telling the casting director, if you can find anyone better than me for this role, cast him immediately. The movie, tentatively retitled 3001, filmed around Texas in 2004. According to the cast and crew, it was a relatively straightforward and fun shoot. But behind the scenes, Judge was dealing with headache after headache from the studio. The budget was only a few million dollars, but they were nickel and diming him, refusing to pay for several visual effects shots. This resulted in Judge asking his friend, Robert Rodriguez, to do some of the shots, which the filmmaker kindly supplied free of charge. Another hassle Judge experienced was making sure his futuristic movie actually seemed like it was set in the future, which meant choosing wardrobe that could be plausible 500 years from now. One day, the production's costume designer brought in some clunky footwear that was made of plastic. Judge thought, look at these stupid plastic shoes, you'd have to be an idiot to wear them. He was wary of using them in the film out of concern they could actually become popular by the time it was released, but he was assured that could never happen. Cut to two years later, and Crocs were everywhere. Another time Judge wasn't far off from reality was when he shot two minutes of just a bare butt for the movie within a movie titled simply Ass. The crew went to a reform school and used 250 students for a scene where a packed movie theater audience can't stop laughing at this quote-unquote film. Judge assumed he would have to direct the crowd, since a movie featuring just a flatulent butt surely wouldn't make any sense without context. To his surprise and dismay, the audience all started laughing without direction and couldn't stop. Judge turned to his director of photography and pondered why they were even bothering to make Idiocracy when they could just release this. But the film's true challenges came after production wrapped. Test screenings began in March 2005, yielding some pretty terrible results. The cast and crew reconvened for reshoots to address some of the problems, and the second round of test screenings garnered much higher results. Judge and the studio butted heads over how to market the movie. Judge felt burned by how Fox mishandled office space and didn't want the same fate for idiocracy. He said the studio was treating it like some kind of deep what if time travel was real movie and not what he said it actually was, the story of an average guy who winds up in a stupid future. Zang, essay. With Office Space a newly minted cult hit and Beavis and Butthead still popular, you might think Fox would have launched a heavy marketing campaign to let the world know something new was coming from Mike Judge. And yet for months, silence. Idiocracy sat on the shelf for over a year and no one involved with the film knew what was going on. Judge speculated that with Office Space, the studio spent millions on advertising only for the film to fail theatrically but become a hit on home video. And perhaps the studio was thinking the same thing would happen with Idiocracy, so why spend money to promote it? Others claim that Fox was simply disappointed because they were under the impression that Idiocracy was going to be dumb yet funny, like Beavis and Butthead. And instead what they got was a funny movie that makes fun of the dumb. But the consensus seems to be that Fox got cold feet when the companies that had allowed their brands to be used in the movie got wind that their brands were actually being mocked. Welcome to Costco. I love you. While making the film, the studio's lawyers actually told Judge to make fun of several big name brands as a way to get them all to agree, as opposed to only choosing one or two and having them feel like they were being singled out. This led to the creation of the Red Light District scene. Allegedly, prior to the movie's release, several of these companies complained to Fox about their depictions. And, not wanting to hurt potential future sponsorships, the studio agreed to bury the movie. Just months before the film's release, Judge was interviewed by Esquire magazine about his career. During the interview, Judge was waiting for Fox to call and allow him to show the reporter the trailer for Idiocracy. The call from the studio never came. In fact, no theatrical trailer was released prior to the film hitting theaters. No press screenings were given to reviewers. There were no ads of any kind, save for a single theatrical poster something a former marketing head at Fox said he had never seen before. Idiocracy was released on only 130 screens in September 2006, with many accusing the studio of giving it a theatrical release purely to fulfill a contractual obligation. Fox even went so far as to label the movie Untitled Mike Judge Comedy on popular ticketing sites like Movie Phone and Fandango, creating confusion for people that may have actually been looking for Idiocracy. With all of that working against it, it's no wonder the film only managed to take in less than half a million dollars in its entire theatrical run. The movie that the studio clearly wanted to fail did just that. But then something happened. Critics who were denied an early screening finally saw the film and began praising it, hailing it as the most potent political film of the year. Variety critic Robert Kohler called it daring, saying it was one of the few films with any ideas. With the movie getting a quick turnaround to home video, people were finally able to see Idiocracy and see it they did, as it amassed over $9 million in home video rentals. For most movies, that would be where the story ends. But for Idiocracy, that's only part of the story. 
When Judge sat down to write this movie, he exaggerated to such extremes that he never thought they would actually come true, at least in his lifetime. When asked about this in a recent interview, he commented, I'm no prophet, I was off by about 490 years. There have been countless videos made comparing a certain political leader's speeches to those by President Dwayne Elizondo Mountain Dew Herbert Camacho. Fox even shut down the possibility of Terry Crews reprising his role as President Dwayne Elizondo Mountain Dew Herbert Camacho for a series of fake campaign ads before the 2016 U.S. election. The studio feared the comedic videos would be viewed by some as attack ads. Even the movie's jokes that seemed outrageous, like the Secretary of State being sponsored by Carl's Jr. I'm a Secretary of State. Brought to you by Carl's Jr practically became prophecy when the actual CEO of Carl's Jr. was nominated to become the United States Secretary of Labor. But it's not just political aspects that have made idiocracy so relevant. Its depiction of a society reliant on pictures for communication mimics the growing obsession with emojis. The film shows a world where curse words are no longer taboo, but used as powerful marketing tools, which seems familiar. Much like the movie's omnipresent fluid, Brondo, we would actually come to see COVID testing sites shamelessly sponsored by big-name stores and drink companies. Even a show like Ow My Balls or a clash between phallic monster trucks don't seem like they would be that out of place on one of today's countless cable channels and streaming services. Corporate mega-mergers like the movie's AT&T, Time Warner, Taco Bell have practically become reality. Look no further than Disney's acquisitions of giant brands like Pixar, Lucasfilm, Marvel, and Idiocracy's owner, 20th Century Fox. Perhaps most outlandish of all was the movie's concept of coffee shops that also offered sexual favors. Man, I could really go for a Starbucks, you know? Yeah, well, I really don't think we have time for a hand job, Joe. Who would imagine that would become a real thing? And yet there's the real-life Fellatio Cafe, located in Geneva, Switzerland. Sure, it's not Starbucks, but are we really that far off? In 2017, Mike Judge was being interviewed on the Sony lot by the New York Times. Tom Rothman, head of Fox at the time of Idiocracy's release, interrupted them to admit that Idiocracy's failure was entirely his fault, to which Judge quickly replied, I agree. Rothman said that Judge and the film were ahead of their time, and perhaps the movie was made 10 years too early. The past few years have seen a rise in comparisons between Idiocracy and the real world. Even the respected Time magazine published an article titled, We Have Become an Idiocracy. The term has become so much more than just the title of a great movie. It's now used regularly when something moronic happens, and the press dubs it an idiocracy moment. Three years after Idiocracy, Judge would return to directing with the comedy Extract, which he financed independently after learning his lessons dealing with studios. Otherwise, he's been busy with the short-lived animated show The Good Family, creating the hit HBO series Silicon Valley, and more adolescent debauchery with new Beavis and Butthead material. Mike Judge has said that with Office Space, it was such a sweet success when it found an audience after the fact. But with Idiocracy, he doesn't feel that same sense of pride, because that film's success has come at the expense of the dumbing down of America. After all, he never dreamed he was making a documentary. And yet, here we are. Trey Parker and Matt Stone were just two struggling college students in Boulder, Colorado, who shared a love of Monty Python and provocative humor when they shot their first film, Cannibal the Musical, about the real-life man-eating prospector Alfred Packer. Made for $100,000, the movie would go on to become an underground hit thanks to notorious cult label Troma Entertainment. After the success of Cannibal, the duo packed up and moved from their quiet town to the traffic-ridden world of Los Angeles. Parker and Stone pitched several projects, but none of them ever got off the ground. So again, the pair took matters into their own hands and made Orgasmo, a movie about a Mormon missionary who mistakenly becomes a porn star. The film, partially funded by a Japanese porn company, premiered at the Toronto Film Festival, where it was bought by independent distributor October Films. Due to the subject matter and its independent distributor, the MPAA slapped the film with an unmarketable NC-17 rating without any explanation. This would be the first run-in the duo had with the MPAA, but certainly not the last. During this time, an animated short film Parker and Stone had made in college circulated around Hollywood. Head of Fox Studios, Brian Graydon, was a fan of the short, and he commissioned the team to create another animated short film for him to send to friends and family for the holidays. This led to the creation of Jesus vs. Santa, or it's more commonly known, The Spirit of Christmas. With the town abuzz over what would become the first ever viral video, Parker and Stone were able to take several pitch meetings for a potential TV show. Then-fledgling cable channel Comedy Central ponied up $300,000 for their pitch, 
and South Park was born. South Park was an instant phenomenon, pulling in over $150 million in merchandise sales alone in the first year. With that success, the next logical step was a movie. Dealing with a major studio like Paramount on the South Park movie was a bit of an adjustment for the creators. Paramount would consistently push the duo to make the film PG-13, saying that rating would bring in more money, but Parker and Stone wouldn't budge. The pair had several conflicts with the MPAA on this film, most notably with the original title, South Park All Hell Breaks Loose. They then changed the title to South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, which the MPAA curiously had no problems with, despite its phallic implication. The movie would maintain its NC-17 rating until just two weeks prior to release, when Paramount called up the MPAA and simply said, we really need this film to be R. Without any edits, the rating was changed. This always rubbed Parker and Stone the wrong way, because with Orgasmo, the MPAA hit it with an NC-17, and that was the end of it. The South Park movie would go on to be a critical and commercial success, even earning a Best Original Song Oscar nomination for Blame Canada, which was performed on stage at the ceremony by the legendary Robin Williams. True to their smart-ass ways, Parker and Stone showed up to the Oscars wearing dresses and tripping on LSD, as Parker revealed years later. And all that success finally brings us to Team America World Police. When movies have behind-the-scenes drama, it generally stems from clashes of ego or creative differences or acts of God that interfere with production. With Team America, the biggest problem they had was quite simply, no one thought making a marionette movie would be so fucking hard. After the challenges Parker and Stone had making the South Park movie, they were initially content with just sticking to the TV show. But while bored one day, Trey Parker came across old episodes of the Jerry Anderson Super Marionation series, Thunderbirds. Parker found the show to be comically bad and decided to inquire about the rights to the show, only to learn that Star Trek The Next Generation's Jonathan Frakes was actually about to make a live-action version of the property. But the wheels had been set in motion. Parker now had a desire to make a full-on marionette movie. One day, while working on South Park, he read in the trades that 20th Century Fox had bought Roland Emmerich's disaster movie, The Day After Tomorrow, based on just a one-line pitch about global warming. Parker brought it to Stone, and they both laughed at the absurdity of it. Not long after that, Parker was actually able to get a copy of the script for The Day After Tomorrow. Finding it to be unintentionally hilarious, he and Stone came up with the idea to do a shot-for-shot -shot version of this script using puppets. They wanted to call it The Day After The Day After Tomorrow and release it one day after The Day After Tomorrow hit theaters. But when they looked into this plan, they were immediately smacked with reality. There was absolutely no legal way they could do it. But they were dead set on making a feature-length movie using only puppets, and now they had their target. Bombastic action movies like The Day After Tomorrow and Jerry Bruckheimer Productions, with additional influence from the 1982 cheese classic Megaforce and its quintessentially goofy flying motorcycle sequence. Paramount initially, and justifiably, expressed concern at the box office viability of an R-rated puppet movie, but they came on board to finance the film. First, Parker and Stone brought in their South Park movie writing partner, Pam Brady. Then, knowing how different this movie would be from anything they had made before, they realized they'd need an experienced director of photography. Enter Bill Pope, the genius responsible for lensing the Matrix trilogy and Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2. Pope had told his agents that he was tired of working on big-budget green-screen spectacles, and after meeting with Parker and Stone, he found what he was looking for. To craft the puppets, Parker and Stone sought out the renowned Kyoto Brothers, famous for their work on killer clowns from outer space and critters, along with Jon Favreau's Elf. The brothers had worked with Parker and Stone before on an episode of their TV show, That's My Bush, and quickly joined up. But once they started working on the film, they realized this was going to be much tougher than any film they had done before. Each puppet was meticulously crafted, with nearly 100 complex mechanical heads and 80 bodies needed to portray the 300 characters that would be seen on screen. Production on Team America World Police began in May 2004, with a planned release date just five months later in October 2004. Parker and Stone had intended to shoot for seven weeks total, breaking in the middle to go work on Season 8 of South Park. As the saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Prior to shooting, they did a rehearsal to see how things would go, and learned that to actually be able to make this movie, they would have to construct several overhead bridges for the puppeteers to work, as well as create holes in the ground for additional puppeteers and light setups. The seven weeks they had allotted for shooting was nowhere near enough time, forcing them to nearly double the schedule. Once filming commenced, the crew had grown exponentially to around 200 people, 
with each puppet requiring four different puppeteers for various maneuvers. They were also having issues with the limitations of what the marionettes could actually do, which required the script to be constantly rewritten. Originally, the script also featured more jokes, but Parker realized that the jokes weren't really landing, and the true comedy came from these puppet characters taking everything super seriously. Another unforeseen issue was the camera setups. Due to the height of the puppets and the vast off-camera walkways for the puppeteers, they couldn't shoot any low angles as the camera would reveal there was no ceiling. They also couldn't shoot high angles because the strings on the marionettes would stand out more on camera. The puppets also couldn't walk realistically, which meant blocking each shot took much longer to figure out, with some shots taking upwards of three hours for the camera to first be set up, then the puppeteers figuring out the movements. Not only were Parker and Stone dealing with the nightmare logistics of making a feature-length marionette movie during the day, but at night they would be hard at work on South Park. And at this time, they had also started working with future double EGOT winner Robert Lopez on the play The Book of Mormon. With all of that work being done simultaneously, Matt Stone would later proclaim that making Team America was the absolute worst time of his life, saying he would work 20 hours a day, take sleeping pills to go to bed, and then drink coffee to stay awake. In an interview with Entertainment Weekly at the time, Stone said, I want this movie to be done so bad. It's all I think about every second of every day. F*** this movie, I want to go home. Parker echoed those sentiments, saying in an interview, You could threaten to kill my family, and I would not make another puppet movie. Making matters even worse, Parker, Stone, and producer Scott Rudin were essentially making the movie for no pay. In order to get the initial green light, the trio forfeited their upfront salaries. When the budget ballooned, they were forced to give up any back-end deals. It seems they were right. Freedom is in free. The original concept for the film was about a group of actors taking control of the White House in order to sell out America to the rest of the world. But once America entered into the Iraq War, that changed, and the filmmakers saw an opportunity to skewer the self-serious actors that were being interviewed on news programs about the war rather than actual foreign policy leaders. No one was safe from their wrath not even South Park superfan and guest actor George Clooney. Parker said, we weren't going to be hypocritical and say, well, let's not pick on George, he's our friend. We're like, nope, fuck you, George. Clooney later commented that he would have been offended if he was not in the movie. Even the normally confrontational Alec Baldwin took his ribbing with pride and says that even to this day, if someone yells at him, you are worthless, Alec Baldwin! He responds, back at you, Kim. Even Matt Damon. Matt Damon. The celebrity who's probably had the most lasting impact on his name since Team America's release has taken it all in good fun. At first he didn't quite understand why his character was only capable of saying his name in that particular way. Matt Damon. But he was eventually amused when Parker later said that Damon's character was meant to be smart and charming, but the filmmakers realized the finished puppet looked mentally deficient, so they changed the character to say only those two infamous words. Matt Damon. Of course, not everyone was pleased with their portrayal. Prior to the movie's release, Sean Penn sent Parker and Stone a letter berating them and signing it, a sincere fuck you, Sean Penn. The pair found it hilarious because everything Penn wrote in the letter was inadvertently almost verbatim what his puppet says in the movie. Kapla! The one public figure parodied in the film that the creators would love to know if he even saw the movie was North Korean dictator and noted cinephile Kim Jong-il who got the last laugh by taking that knowledge with him to the grave. You shall see, I will be back! And let's not forget the movie's amazing songs. Parker grew up with a love of musical theater, and that admiration is infused in everything he does. In Team America, the music becomes another way to ridicule the cheesy melodrama of big-budget action films with their power ballads and rah-rah spirit. Songs like Montage, The End of an Act, and of course, America, fuck yeah, all feel like songs from huge blockbuster movies, yet feature lyrics like, I miss you more than Michael Bay missed the mark when he made Pearl Harbor. As with all studio movies, the executives get to see the first cut so they can get a feel for marketing and witness the product of their investment. At the studio screening for Team America, when the lights dimmed and the film began playing, the first shot is of a crappy-looking marionette against a horribly drawn background. Upon seeing this, one studio executive allegedly shouted, They fucked us! Of course, the shot then pulls back to reveal a fully realized marionette world. Parker said he filmed the opening that way specifically to mess with the studio executives. 
like all their films, Team America was originally hit with an NC-17 rating. Even in doll form, the MPAA still has problems with sex scenes in movies. Parker would edit and resubmit the film nine times before the MPAA lowered the film to an R rating. In total, only 45 seconds of footage was removed, but anyone who's seen the unrated cut knows those 45 seconds are magnificently raunchy. Parker and Stone would later admit they made the sex scene way more graphic in order to distract the MPAA from the rest of the film, noting that the MPAA cares more about one second of a sex scene than they do about someone getting their head blown off. Team America World Police was released on October 15, 2004, where it opened in third place behind Shark Tale and Friday Night Lights. The movie finished with $51 million worldwide, on a budget that had risen to $32 million. Critical reception for the film was fairly positive, with most critics appreciating the satirical takedown of Hollywood culture and aggressive foreign tactics, while others, including Roger Ebert, didn't seem to really get the joke. Over the years, the film has gained cult status, with many people discovering the unrated cut on DVD. Quentin Tarantino has listed it as one of his favorite films released since 1992, and several publications have listed it in the top 10 funniest movies ever made. Since Team America's release, Trey Parker and Matt Stone have become Tony and Grammy Award winners for their stage play The Book of Mormon, which has grossed over $500 million to date, making it one of the most successful Broadway musicals of all time, even bigger than Cats. And South Park continues to be one of the smartest and most relevant shows on TV. Team America World Police may have gained notoriety as the movie with puppet fornication or a puking marionette that earned internet meme status, but it's much more than that. A takedown of self-serious celebrities, a scathing statement on America's foreign policy, and a demonstration of sexual positions that even the Kama Sutra might have overlooked. Parker and Stone haven't dared to make another big screen movie since their excruciating experience on Team America, but it seems after 17 years they may be bringing that moratorium to an end. They're working on bringing the Book of Mormon to the big screen and Parker has recently said that they have really killer ideas for other films that are unrelated to South Park. Finally, we might get another Trey Parker, Matt Stone feature film? Fuck yeah! Thank you for watching. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel, tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company, and we appreciate your support.